Hi everyone, my name is Anmol. Um, so thank you so much for being here today. Our inquiries are normally held in Parliament, but due to the pandemic, we've had to hold it virtually. We know it's been a really difficult time for everyone due to COVID-19, but we felt it was vital for our children and young people to have the opportunity for their voices to be heard. Especially now, where children's rights are even more important due to the impact of COVID-19 on children and young people. Today is not only our children's rights inquiry, but it's also Human Rights Day, which is an important day for all of us, I guess, as it identifies everyone as being equal, regardless of their gender, race, age, and the list goes on. put this inquiry together, we have been supported by our Link Up crew. They are a group of seven to 15 year olds that meet monthly to discuss and implement change on political matters that impact children. So throughout the pandemic, they have been working so hard by meeting virtually just to prepare for this day. And this inquiry serves as a testament to children and young people who experience and witness issues in their day-to-day -day life. This inquiry hopes to give young people the power to uphold their rights and make a real positive change towards something better. If we are to fully engage with the issues that young people face, we must give them the platform to be a part of the change that they wish to see. I really do look forward to hearing what discussions will arise out of today. And I hope that all the children from schools that are here today will use this as a platform to ask questions or voice their opinions when it comes to change. This inquiry isn't so much about the number of attendees, it's about the outcome of the event. So we're really looking forward to your contributions today, but also to carry on the conversation after the event and in the new year. Before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. Could I just please remind people to keep their mics turned off unless they are speaking and cameras on so it's not intimidating for the children and young people. So mics off and cameras on, please. So without further ado, I would now like to pass it on to the Deputy Mayor for Education, Joanne McCartney. Thank you, Tasmin. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you all today to the Children's Rights Inquiry, which is part of Human Rights Day. And as Tasmin said, my name is Joanne McCartney and I'm the Deputy Mayor for Education and Child Care. And it's a great honour to open the inquiry, which is now in its fourth year. Um, and this year has been like no other. We have faced huge challenges across the world and across our city due to the pandemic COVID-19. It's influenced our lives, our health, our communities and well, just about everything. And most significantly, it's highlighted the dramatic inequalities of COVID within the Black, Asian and minority ethnic community. Now this year's inquiry will be on education, race and discrimination and refugees and migrants. And Sadiq and I believe that the best way to create a London that is safe and that works for children and young people is to involve them, that's you, in decision making. And in holding those conversations such as this that will spark ideas for long-term solutions. Now seeing as children's rights are for children and young people, who better to hold an inquiry than those who are directly and indirectly affected? So can I just say a thank you to all the incredible children and young people who have organised and are participating in today's event. We must not forget that today's children and young people will be our future leaders, active citizens, and most importantly, supply the city with its future mayors of London. And to those of you who are here because you work with children and young people, can I just say a big thank you? And I recognise the critical role that you play as practitioners across many different agencies, charities, schools and community organisations in providing a safe, supportive and inclusive city for young Londoners to grow up in. We in the Greater London Authority strongly value the dedicated work that you do, and particularly over this past year. Now, I'm really looking forward to this inquiry. Um, and of course, learning um, about your ideas for improving our quality of life and how we can improve those experiences for young people in London, especially those who might otherwise struggle. And all of us know there is so much more we need to do to uphold children's rights. Now, lessons from our previous children's rights inquiries, um, we noted that it was often the small actions that can make really big differences. Therefore, I am keen to continue the dialogue that we'll be having today 
and most importantly to ensure that those opportunities for our children and young people um, that they have the opportunity to choose to engage with those decision makers who are making decisions that affect them. But before I finish, I just want to acknowledge all the hard work that's been done to make this event possible. It's not been easy. Um, I'm very grateful that we're doing this virtually, but I would just like to end by just saying a really big thank you to our um, um, peer outreach team, and in particular to Tasmin and Mole and Amina, who have truly made this a youth-led event. And can I just finish by just wishing you all an illuminating and productive inquiry, and I'll be listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanne. Really appreciate your um, attendance today as well. Um, could I now hand over to Queenie, who will be chairing, um, co-chairing our first section on education alongside our Link Up crew members who she will introduce. So Queenie. Thank you so much, Tasmin, and a huge welcome to everybody that's on this call today and all of the amazing young people that I'm seeing um, on this screen today. It's a pleasure to have you all. Um, my name is Queenie, I'm a peer outreach worker, and I'm just most looking forward to co-chairing this session with some amazing young people. And without further ado, I'd love to introduce these young people so that they can introduce themselves um, and what they're looking forward to today. So I'll hand over to Aaliyah, Farah, and Michael. Hi, um, I'm Alia and I'm 11. Hi everyone, I'm Farah Sarich and I'm 11 years old. Cool. Hello, I'm Michael and I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Thank you for joining us, Michael. Um, and so now we'll now be going, I'll now like to hand over to some of our panel and members to introduce themselves, where they're from um, and to lead the conversation this um, afternoon. And you'll find in the chat box and the lineup of the amazing um, panelists that we have today. So over to you, panelists. Okay, hi everyone. It's terrific to be here at the Children's Rights Inquiry 2020. I'm really looking forward to hearing from the panelists to follow in this session. I think I'm like the warm up act. Um, but most importantly, listen to your reactions, your views, <coughs> and then any experiences you might want to share. So, why am I here talking to you? My name's Jason Lever. I'm the Education Policy Manager at the Greater London Authority. And I work to support Joanne, who you've just met, um, and many other people. But actually, it's just as much because of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and Young Person that I'm here. So I'm gonna just give you a little filling in on that. Nearly 20 years ago, I worked for the NSPCC and my job with other children's organisations was to make the case to whoever was going to be the first mayor of London that one of their real priorities must be to make London a child friendly city. And we supported something that was called the Office of the Children's Rights Commissioner for London. And some of you might know there's now a Children's Rights Commissioner for England and they looked to see what we were doing in London, among other things. But when the mayor of London role started up back in 2000. Did any of the mayors have to actually do things to support London's 2,840,000 children, young people? Well, no is the answer, at least on paper. Or if you're going to get a bit more technical, the Act of Parliament that brought the GLA together. But why? This is such an important area that it was mostly seen the, the UK government or your local boroughs are the ones to deal with this. And the GLA was meant to be about all the big strategic decisions and the planning of the city, which is really important and we do lots of. But if we thought about that, and we did at the time, well, you know, you take the environment. What about the impact of bad air quality and pollution that's around nurseries and schools? That's really relevant for children, young people. That's something um, Sadiq and the teams are working on really hard now. Policing, isn't it really important to keep schools and colleges safe for young people and in their communities? Of course. Housing, don't overcrowded homes or families that have to be in temporary accommodation impact on children's education, making that harder, let alone their health and well-being. And there were many more examples, but we used 
there are arguments based in the rights in the UN Convention to make the case that whoever was going to become the first mayor of London must consider the needs and, as Joanne said, crucially involve the voices of young Londoners. So, close to 20 years on, I'm just as excited working in this area, having worked for three mayors and Sadiq now, and still trying to make this happen. But I can honestly say, not just because my boss is listening, but more than at any other time, so many teams across City Hall, hundreds of my colleagues working on those areas that I mentioned and in many others, they really do think about and factor in what their policies and their projects will mean for children and young people. And an extra call out for some of the peer outreach workers now and their predecessors, because they've been doing this for nearly 14 years. Um, and of course, all the ideas that you come up with today and the discussion that we'll have soon, we'll be gathering and we'll take that back to those colleagues. Now, what's the GLA doing at the moment? Well, there's tons of things, but just to give you a few examples around why we are playing our role in supporting your education and development. Um, it's very important that there's play and recreation space when new housing developments are built. And that's something that the mayor has strategic powers over so there's strong guidance about having minimum standards to make sure that's in place there's a big volunteering push called team london and from the very start schemes for young people to volunteer were built in and of course doing volunteer work sits really well alongside educational qualifications and work experience close to my heart around health and my team, which is education and youth, works really closely with the health team. There's many things, but I'll mention one, which was some great videos, sort of podcast style, some of you may have seen, that were produced by Thrive London, Mind TV, Mental Health First Aiders, and some of the stars of our peer outreach team. And that was really important that we had these up online for when children, young people were returning to school and college just a few months ago. And the last example I'll give is free travel scheme for under 18s on buses and trams came in 15 years ago to help both um, poorer families to reduce car usage and also open up London for all young people. And its continuation against government plans to end it has just been successfully headed off by Sadiq and with the help of many young people campaigning. Now, I was asked to talk in terms of Article 28 of the UN Convention, which is the right to an education. Now, at the core of that, and I'm sure Mike will cover this soon from Ofsted, there's the really important things about holding schools to account, make sure they're teaching really well, students come out of it um, and go on to their next stage even better equipped, and all sorts of things there. And we work closely with Mike, and in fact, we also work with the other speakers on this panel that you'll hear from in a minute. But we don't actually, the mayor doesn't actually have a statutory role in education. Some big city mayors around the world also run the schools hands on. Now, we work really closely with schools, with boroughs, teachers, lots of other experts. And what we particularly try and do is run initiatives that help more disadvantaged background or high need groups of children to be able to take part fully in education and have a more equal chance of doing so. So a couple of examples, we have a great project called Stepping Stones to help make that bridge between primary and secondary school. Some of you will have done that and some of you might have that coming up and we know that can be really difficult. We also, for an older age group, the mayor's been investing 45 million pounds in over 300 projects that aim to reach over 100,000 young Londoners in the next few years. And already just under 60,000 young people have benefited from these projects right across London, from opportunities around theatre groups, counselling help, employability training, football clubs, art sessions. And during this difficult period this year um, with coronavirus, we also put in another two million pounds so we can have an extra 100 projects as well. A lot of work with teachers and students is to make sure that all young people have the information 
opportunities and support they need to go on to their next steps. And one of the things we've really been pushing and encouraging is around STEM, which is a bit of jargon, but is science, tech, engineering and maths. And that includes us really working to tackle the stereotypes of who actually works in these fields, whether that's based on gender or class or ethnicity or disability. And I'll come back to that right at the end. But the common thing about all those examples I gave is that they're building blocks and they're foundations for the right to an education that can enable all young people to flourish under Article 29, which our organisers also asked me to mention. So Article 29 is really about the outcomes. What's the quality of what education provides us all? And in the words of the United Nations, it's all about the development of the child or young person's personality, their talents and their mental and physical abilities to fulfill their potential. Now, in the world that we are right now, um, as Joanne alluded to at the beginning, and wherever we are in the world, we do know that it's a particularly extra tricky time in our education and moving on into jobs because of the coronavirus. But on the plus side, and I'm talking about London because that's where most of us are living um, at the moment, we do have better educational attainment than a lot of the rest of the country. And that's something we should be proud of. Um, I don't know whether Mike's going to talk a little bit on this. So sorry, Mike, if you've got some stats here. But also we know at City Hall that that's not the same for everybody. Um, we know about a quarter of London's younger children don't get to the right level of development at the age of five that we'd like. Um, we also know that nearly a third, around 30 percent, don't get a nine to four um, grade pass at GCSE. Um, and also about a third don't get the qualification that would be good for them to get by the time they're 19. And some of that is because of differences um, with the differences that we see there are around um, those who are on free school meals, those who aren't, those with special education needs and disabilities, and also by ethnicity. And we really look at that closely to see where we can help. And in relation to the time we're in at the moment, I thought it's really important to let you all know that there's something called the London Recovery Board, which is the mayor working with all the different borough councils in London and many other partners. And it's come up with a, a mission to have a new deal for young people. And that's all about all young people in need being entitled to a personal mentor and all young Londoners having access to quality local youth activities. We're still working this through. So any ideas that come out of today will really help us, but that could be a number of different things. It could be help on the catch up in education where children have missed some of the schooling, it could be thinking about employment support for those older, help with social skills, support around mental health and well-being, um, and particularly looking at the groups that have been most affected by the pandemic. And we want to think creatively about who are those trusted individuals that you might go to who can really help with some personalised support and mentoring. I'll finish in a second now. Um, what I just wanted to broaden it out a little bit before I finish and to say that the right to education is partly to equip us for all of life's opportunities, but not just as individuals. It's also about our place in society as well. It links with helping us, you, shape it as active citizens. And I gave the example of young people helping campaign to keep the free um, travel. It's about knowing your rights. It's about supporting others that need help and really making sure your voices are heard. And we've seen many young Londoners step up to the challenges over the last eight months. And it's been really inspiring to see how many have navigated these challenges and supported each other. Education should also be about steering us towards careers and jobs that we might not have thought of and that hopefully can be challenging, they can be really fulfilling and also hopefully reward us for what we want in life ourselves. And just a few statistics which I've been asked to throw in. At the moment, if you look at everybody in London, um, say between the age of 16 and, and 64, just 
under 90% uh, of them who have qualifications equivalent to A-levels or A-levels are working, but this compares to only half that don't have qualifications. But looking ahead positively, it's reckoned that 90% of all jobs are gonna require some form of digital knowledge in the next 20 years. And note that the qualifications and this knowledge doesn't always mean A-levels and degrees, that could be absolutely right. But I think it's really important to say apprenticeships are a terrific route too. And we see it every year at City Hall with a dozen apprentices we have. It can be tough out there to make that move from going through schooling and thinking about what you wanna do afterwards. But there are some positives as well. I sometimes do careers talks at my old school or college and uh, I try and reassure people a bit that one of the positive things these days is that employers are getting to be more open about who they take on. They're interested in young people having a range of experiences and interests who have volunteered, who've tried different things in different areas, but of course, some solid qualifications are really important as well. So to finish back on that topic of STEM, science, tech, engineering, and maths, I just want to leave you with an example there. The STEM sectors in this country are really growing fast and the supply of skilled workers to do those roles, we, we, we can't keep up with the demand. And they reckon that's actually costing the country something like six billion pounds a year because we're not developing that talent. And we also know that sadly, many women, many ethnic minority groups, LGBTQ plus people and people from poorer backgrounds, all of them are very often underrepresented in those jobs. They're not going into them. And this is both an economic and a social problem because we've learned and there's some great books out on this recently. If you don't have the diversity of those people working in all those science jobs, it makes it harder for us to ask the right questions and deliver the best services for everybody, for all Londoners, whatever their backgrounds, whatever their situation. So at the moment, the response to tackling coronavirus, which has been led by scientists, we, the education system, invested in a lot of them years and years ago and the young people most affected by this pandemic will be statistically least represented among the next generation of scientists. And that's not good. I'm hoping that some of you might want to back that trend. Clearly, other areas are important too. The humanities, lots of other areas of work, but it's just a bit of a plug there. So I'm gonna finish at that point and hand you back over to our hosts, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from Lavinia, Claire and Mike and talking to you a bit more about this afterwards. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Jason. Thank you. Um, it's good to hear um, some of the stuff and some of the work that's going to towards bettering education. And now um, for the next um, 10 minutes, I'd like to hand over to Farah to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Queenie, and thank you, Jason. Um, next is uh, Lavinia Stennett. Uh, the founder and CEO of the Black Curriculum. Yeah, hi, my name is Lavinia. I'm the founder and CEO of the Black Curriculum. I recently graduated from SOAS, which is a university in central London, where I studied African studies. Um, and I like to write sometimes um, when I'm not working. So this is um, a small introduction to the Black Curriculum and I'm gonna explain why it's really important. Um, and how it kind of connects to, to children's rights and equality for all young people. So um, a question to everyone, how regularly are you learning about black history in school? If I could just have a show, maybe a show of hands, um, if you're learning it every single month of the year, please put your hand up so I can see. Okay, um, or maybe if we could just shout out, um, in October, how many of us have actually learned about black history in school? A little bit, just a little bit. Okay, okay, so yeah, so it's a problem. At the moment, black history is not mandatory. It's not um, a compulsory part of our curriculum. It is 
taught within Black History Month, and that's the only time usually that we'll hear anything about Black history. And this is where the Black curriculum comes in, because um, our approach to learning is that every single part of history is important. Um, black people have been in the UK since Roman times, and there is archaeological evidence to showcase that. Um, and so therefore our history and other subjects that teach about the society that we live in should include the histories of all people. So we done a little bit of a study at the Black Curriculum earlier this year with another group and run by young people called the Impact of Omission. And this is the statistics. So 72% of Brits learn about the Battle of Hastings versus 8% learning about the role of British colonization of Africa. 86% um, of Brits learn about the Tudors in school and 9% of us learn about the role of slavery in the British Industrial Revolution. So again, we can see that there's a clear disparity here when it comes to learning about um, events in history, it's more focused on um, aspects that aren't really, really kind of engaging um, or relevant to our society today. So um, the role of slavery and the, industrial re and the industrial revolution actually is a very tangible and a very important part of our history that plays a role in what we see today. So um, we go up to Glasgow, for example, you look at all the buildings, those buildings were created through the materials that were um, based off of um, the, the period of enslavement, so the transatlantic slave trade, it has a direct link to some of the buildings that exist today. And the same is for London. So like you walk past banks, for example, like um, Barclays, um, Lloyds, they all played a role in the British industrial, sorry, in the, in the British slave trade. So these are really key parts of our history and we don't really learn these, these um, important facts. And so the black curriculum um, comes in because we want to teach all young people about the truth of British history. Um, and sometimes that truth is bad and it's also very good. So for example, you have um, examples of Tudors, black Tudors who existed during the Tudor times, hundreds of them, but we don't know anything about them. We might know about one guy called John Blanc who was Henry VIII's trumpeter and he even played at Henry VIII's dad's funeral. So he was a very talented musician, but yet we don't really learn about that in our history books. So bringing black history into its entirety is thinking about all aspects of history and not just kind of celebrating the bad part, sorry, celebrating the good parts of British history, but also thinking about how can we bring together everything so that we have full knowledge and full understanding. Um, and that is important because every single person deserves to be treated fairly. We know that if you don't know your history, if you don't know somebody else's history, you're more likely to actually be more ignorant and therefore treat them differently. So when we're thinking about equality and when we're thinking about fairness, it's really key that what we are learning our history is ways to encourage a lot more equality for everybody. And this is a practical way that we can do that. You don't have to be in the Royal Courts of Justice to enforce fairness, but you can actually start enforcing fairness from the classroom and um, by teaching material that is a little, little bit more inclusive. So the Black Curriculum's vision is to make sure that all young people across the UK, at least once in their life, learn about Black history and feel empowered by that. So that aim is really to build a sense of identity and awareness in all young people. We also want to improve social cohesion. So again, coming back to this idea of if we're not learning each other's history, we're going to be so fragmented. If I don't know where Susan comes from or Femi comes from, I'm more likely to just go about my day, not really kind of understand why it's important to treat people with respect. And if I do see an injustice happen to somebody, I'm more likely because of my understanding to be able to stop that from happening or at least to intervene. So it brings us together. So those are the two main goals of the Black Curriculum. And we set up last year. So we go into schools and we teach young people like yourselves, Black history based on our syllabus. And we also train teachers to be able to teach Black history in a more inclusive way. So we've been doing this work nearly, well, it was founded in 2019. So I'd say like a year and a half. And um, we are working across the UK and also with GLA to be able to do this work more effectively. So um, the black curriculum, as you can see in that uh, corner 
the, the photo in the corner, um, we produced a report which basically explores why um, the, this is an issue and how we can correct it. Um, so if you're interested in research, please share that. And then in, in the other photo on the other side, you can see that I'm there with an MP to encourage them to uh, support the teaching of black history because again this isn't just something that happens um, within the classroom but it's a societal thing it includes everybody so in order to come to a future that is inclusive we've got to come to know the past um, so again here's some photos of us in assemblies and also working with primary school students to teach them about the bristol bus boycotts um, so the key is to make sure that this information is accessible to every single young person so that we can all enforce equality and fairness. If you would like to know more about the Black Curriculum, um, you can find our Instagram, which is the Black Curriculum and Twitter. So this is the Instagram. Um, so it's the Black Curriculum and our website is also theblackcurriculum.com. Also, our YouTube, we've got loads of animations and short videos around pieces of Black Black History, and you can find us on YouTube at The Black Curriculum. Um, and that's it. I don't have anything else to say. If you'd like to know more, please do feel free to ask me a question in the chat. I'll be here. And um, thank you very much for listening. Amazing. Thank you so much, Lavinia. And um, honestly, excellent to see what you've done. It's incredible. Um, and also, there will be a question um, and answer section in a short while and if you have any questions you know that would be a perfect opportunity as well um and also um as we go on to the next slide i'll be handing over to one of our amazing um chairs to hand over to the next speaker but just to um share that because we do have a tight schedule and it's amazing that we're hearing from everybody and um, we just want to ensure that we're sticking to the schedule um and so that we're on time with everything and without further ado i will hand over to michael to introduce our next panelist hello um thank you everyone for listening so far i'm going to hand over to claire wooderson if she could just introduce herself and say what she has to say to us great thank you so much can everyone hear me yeah brilliant Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, just before I start speaking and I introduce myself, I'm just going to warn you that I have a black cat here who is obsessed with being on the camera. So this is little Paxton and little Paxton loves nothing more than to jump on my laptop when I'm talking. And so if you see little flashes of black cat, uh, this is Paxton trying to get in on the action. So I work for an organization called the Mayor's Fund for London. The Mayor's Fund for London is based in City Hall or at least was up until the pandemic began. And it's an independent charity that was set up um, about 11 years ago now, which champions social mobility for young Londoners. So we do a mixture of campaign activities and also support activities in the areas of well-being, skills, employability and education. So every year we support around 40,000 uh, children and young people across London. My job is the head of social inclusion. And that means that I oversee one of our largest programs, Kitchen Social, which provides food for children in the school holidays. So we talk a lot about kids' education. We talk a lot about what happens within schools. But when we think about education, we often don't think about those other weeks where children aren't in school. There are 13 weeks throughout the year where kids and young people are not in education. They're not in school. And actually, that's a very long time in comparison to when they are. That's a huge proportion of the, uh, the year. And so we focus in very specifically on that time. So I don't want to go through too much of the, the kind of research side of things. I mean, I barely understand this stuff. But essentially, we know that when kids aren't in school, kids from a lower socioeconomic um, background means that they don't have the same access to educational resources and opportunities and skills in their home as children from a higher socioeconomic background. And that means that they're at risk of an education and a skills loss. So over those school holidays, while some groups of kids are able to go on holiday and have private tutors and have lots of really fun opportunities with their friends and they learn things and they learn things in different ways. There's another group of children for whom that isn't true. They're at home, they perhaps don't have opportunities to go on holiday or spend time with their friends doing interesting and exciting things. They probably don't have private tutors 
and their learning stagnates and sometimes actually goes backwards. So when they get back to school after the holidays, and this is particularly true of the summer holidays, which is six weeks and the longest by a long way, when they go back to school, they're actually in a worse position than their friends and their peers. And that means if they're doing that every year from the age of four or five, when they join school, up until the age that they leave, by the time they leave, there's this big gap between one group of children and another group of children. One group of children who've had all these brilliant holidays, brilliant summers, seen a lot of the world, had a lot of support from their parents, had a lot of access to resources in their home, and the other group who haven't. So this is where Kitchen Social comes in. Now we know that there are 400,000 young children and young people in London who are living in households that are in food insecurity. Because of the pandemic, that number is increasing and it's more like 500,000. So in the last year, as a result of the pandemic, we've seen a 25% increase. Only half of those children are eligible for free school meals. That means there's 250,000 children in London who don't get additional support from the government when they're in school with regard to food access. So these are really high numbers. And those children, those 250,000 children, not only don't get that support when they're in school, but they also get less support outside of school as well. So what we did as an organization to combat this is we set up the program Kitchen Social and Kitchen Social funds meals for children as part of holiday provision across London. So we operate in 23 of the 32 boroughs in London and we work really closely with adventure playgrounds, schools, um, youth clubs, theatres, urban farms to put on really exciting educational opportunities for young people. So where they can come and they can play and they can learn together and also get a really high quality nutritious meal whilst they're doing that. We know from the research that education and health are really closely linked. So pupils with better health and well-being are likely to achieve better academic results. And we already know that the government has invested in this when it comes to the link between nutrition and education by funding universal free school meals and also funding breakfast clubs as well. So we know that when we make available nutritious high quality food and educational opportunities within the school holidays, that makes a big difference to young people. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how we know that shortly. So the long school breaks, we've talked a little bit about the educational gap, food poverty, food insecurity, and social isolation during that period, not only impacts on children's ability to learn and children's opportunities to learn, but it also impacts on their physical development and their mental development. So it can lead to lower self-esteem, it can lead to weight gain, and it can also lead to physical development limitations. So we know that physically, children don't grow as strong and as big when they are experiencing food insecurity as when they are healthy and have access to high quality food. We evaluated the difference that Kitchen Social makes to young people. And what our two year evaluation showed us, which we did with an organization called the University of Northumbria, it showed us that the program contributes social than when they weren't, higher physical activity levels. So they're far more active when they're at Kitchen Social and they're getting lots more exercise and staying really healthy. Involvement in activities, so that's the access to educational opportunities, uh, as well as a readiness to learn. So staying in that mentality of learning for when they return to school, meaning they can jump in faster when they get back to school. On top of that, it also led to better employment opportunities for parents and a positive financial impact on a family as a whole. So there were lots and lots of benefits for this model across London. And one of our parents said to us, we're able to do things with our children. We're able to meet other parents. And my child always looks forward to the activities, which I find really refreshing. Where I come from, there are no activities for children. And the cheapest provision I could find was 16 pounds per person. So without Kitchen Social, my child would be bored at home as the most that I could do with them would be to go to the park. 
So for us, 2020 has been a very unusual year, as it has for everyone. And because children came out of school for the lockdown period, Kitchen Social decided that although it wasn't a school holiday, it was still our responsibility to do something for those children. And so over that period, we had 30 emergency hubs across London, and we were serving food through those um, hubs, and we uh, served around 120,000 meals. But perhaps more importantly, we were able to get educational resources into households. We were able to get arts and crafts supplies, sports equipment, and books into households so that children could continue to learn and could continue their education throughout that period. Just to say we have about two minutes on the clock. Great, thank you. One of the other things we did was we know that obviously this combination of a lack of activity at home and a lack of food can be really detrimental to young people's health. And so we thought, how could we bring those two things together in terms of creating a solution? And what we created is something called the Take and Make Recipe Box. And this is a recipe box that's very much like HelloFresh or Mindful Chef, if you've heard of those, boxes that turn up on your doorstep full of ingredients with recipe cards, and they make producing meals at home really easy. So that's where we took our inspiration from. And we created these meal boxes, these recipe boxes called Take and Make, which aims to get children cooking and learning at home with their siblings, with their parents. And these boxes are, have all the ingredients in that you could need to cook a recipe, as well as a recipe card and a corresponding video online as well. And children can take them home and follow the step-by-step -step recipe to create a really nutritious vegetarian meal. And over the summer period, we got 15,000 of those boxes out. We're getting another 6,000 out over Christmas. And we've received really positive feedback from young people about how they're growing in confidence with food, they're growing in confidence in terms of their cooking skills, and they're really enjoying learning at home. And so we know that if we were to go into a further lockdown, then this is something that we could uh, provide for children all over London. That means that they could not only are eating really great food, but actually they have a great source of activity and education within their own household. So our work is not quite done. Children's food insecurity is on the national agenda. I'm sure many of you have heard people talking about it or seen the newspapers where it's been featured. Um, however, the government funding that's been forthcoming is only covering half the holidays, so six of the uh, 13 weeks, and it's only covering 50% of those children, 250, uh, sorry, 250,000 children, um, whereas 250,000 children aren't covered and can't access that provision. So on that basis, we know that actually we've still got a lot of work to do. And our objective in London is for all young people to have access to high quality, inclusive and sustainable holiday provision so that they can keep um, being educated during the school holidays. They can keep learning. They can have a really memorable, positive school holiday before they return to school to continue their formal education. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Clara. Thank you very much. It was great to hear from you. Um, and on that note, I'd love to pass it over to Alia, who would now introduce our next panellist. Thank you, Claire. Um, I'll now, now like to pass it on to Mike Sheridan. Not sure if I'm saying that right. Um, but he's Ofsted's regional director of London. Thank you, Ollie. It's really nice to be here today. Um, it's really good to speak to everybody. Um, as Ollie said, I'm, I'm Mike Sheridan. I'm Ofsted's Regional Director for London. I, I think I've got the second best job in the world, to be honest. The first best was the job that I started off in, which was as a teacher. I used to teach 11-year-olds like Ollie um, and hope that they were as confident as, and as articulate as, as she is. So well, well done for the introduction. Um, so I'm sure many of you have heard of Ofsted um, and I'm sure many of you have seen some of my colleagues coming to your schools to do in inspections. Um, but we don't just look at schools. We, I have a great team in London uh, of, of social, social workers, teachers, um, people who really understand children's homes, experts in further education and experts in early years in childcare. And we report on the full range of, of services that are offered um, for, for, for young people um, in, in this country. Um, and we do that for, for several reasons. We, we, we tell parents about how good things are in, in places that young people go to. Um, we help those 
places improve we help them to think about what they're doing and to make changes that will make them better places to do what they're setting out to do um, and, and you know importantly we help politicians and policymakers uh, like joanna and, and like jason to to make better decisions when they're they're designing things for for young people we don't make policy ourselves what we do is we we point out what's happening and we try to help people see the, the, the benefits and pitfalls of decisions that are being made based on what we know to be happening in the uh, schools and colleges and early years providers and children's homes that, that we, we go and visit. So that's a little bit about what, what we do. And I wanted to talk today a little bit about this most extraordinary year that we've been in. I mean, who, who's had a normal year at school this year? Barra's had a normal year. Any, um, yeah, it's a little bit like that, isn't it? So I think we've got I well, I started secondary school this year, so it was like, yeah. Yeah, interesting. And and, and how did it feel finishing primary school, Farah? Uh, good because I kind of got all the tests over and done with in January, and then I could kind of relax. So you had half a year off. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and it's 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 been it's been a really interesting time, that because that's not usual, is it? It's turned life upside down for all of us, really. I've, I'm sitting in my my office at home at the moment. Usually, I would be sitting in an office in, in London, or even better, in a room with all of you people being able to talk to you face to face. Um, I, I want to talk about some of the stuff we've been doing and some of the findings that we've had. And the main finding we've got is that we've really got to try to keep schools open at all costs during these really difficult times. And, and the reason we need to keep them open is because they're crucial uh, to make sure that children's education and, and, and welfare is, is well taken care of. Um, and I want to unpick some of the reasons for this and just uh, explore some of these with you and then take your questions. So the, the first one is that we, we know that lots of children haven't gone back to school. Most children have, but we know that there are some children who haven't gone back to school and those that have gone back to school, they're not going back as often as they, they need to. So we know, for example, in pupil referral units, places where, where children go who struggle in mainstream school, that we're, we're seeing lower uh, attendance there than what we have seen in the past. And it's never been very good attendance there. We know that, that there are a, a huge number of children uh, in comparative to what we've had in the past who are now being home educated. The parents have chosen to uh, educate them at home. In itself, that's, that's fine. Some of you may be um, home educated. Um, but, but we also know that, that some of those decisions haven't been made for good educational reasons. It's because of fear or because parents have liked having children around. And we're really concerned that all those young people need to be getting a, an education that helps them to go on and, and, and do the things that they're capable of doing in adult life. Um, and we've also seen some children with, with special educational needs or medical needs not being able to return to school and where they have been returning to school, not getting all of the services and, and, and things that they've needed in the past um, because some of the services from, um, from medical services and, 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 and things like swimming haven't yet gone back to being um, normal. So that's the first reason we've got, we've got some children missing and they're invisible at the moment to us. And it's really important to remember that schools are the place where we often see where things are going wrong for young people. It's, it's that place where young people go to most days and, and, and they see a teacher who they, they, they know, they see their friends. Um, and, and it's where we, we, we notice when things are going wrong at home or, or where um, children are, are struggling with, with mental health or where they're struggling with work or they're falling behind either socially or, or academically. And that's been a real gap we've seen, during, particularly during the first lockdown when most children weren't in school. Now I say most children because some children were going into school. If your mum or dad was working in hospitals or they were another key worker, they, then you were able to go into into school during that first lockdown. And also some vulnerable young people, so children, for example, with a social worker, were able to go into school at that time. But we found that actually many children who could go into school during the first lockdown didn't. And we're quite worried about some of those children who perhaps have a social worker because they're, they're, they're struggling in some aspects of their life, hadn't made it into school during that time. Who's been doing some remote learning over the past year where they've had to be working on a, a Zoom call like this or they've been sent some packs home? It's been an interesting thing. Schools have worked really hard to do that. It's not easy for teachers to not stand at the front of the classroom and, and talk and present their work and to help children as they go. Um, and what we've found, we've looked at what schools have been doing really carefully here. Schools are trying really, really hard to get this right. 
um, and, and schools are doing some really interesting stuff to, to, to fill that gap, but it's never as good as being in, in schools. It's, it's never as good as having the teacher there to interact with, to be able to, to talk through it and, and, and work with. It's hard to be motivated. Who finds it easy to sit at their desk at home and work without a teacher overseeing them? Not as easy. Um, we miss our friends when we're not at school. We, we, we don't have that same social interaction. We don't have the opportunity to catch up with what's happening with other people in, in, our, in our class and in our friendship bubbles when we're sat at home working on our own or looking at a Zoom screen like we are today. And there's also the thing about fairness of access. You know, some people haven't got computers at home. Those who have got computers might be sharing them. Not everybody has a, a nice, quiet place to sit in and, and, and work. Not everybody has um, parents or older brothers and sisters that could help them with their, their work when they, they get stuck. And that's led to some further inequalities that Jason talked about earlier at the beginning of, of this session. So my overriding message today is that we need to do everything we can to keep schools open. And we need to encourage all young people to get back into schools and attending regularly. But what's more than that, it's really important that we encourage policymakers, people working for the GLA people who, who work for local authorities to do everything they can to get the services back up and running that have fallen by the wayside, particularly for the most vulnerable young people. And it's really encouraging today to hear uh, colleagues from the, the, um, from the mayor's office talking about re-establishing uh, services for young people, making sure there's places for young people to go to to socialise, to get the support that they need. Because this has been the most challenging year in my life. It has been the most extraordinary challenge for, for I think, many, many people working with young, young people. Um, and it's really, really important. We now start to think about how we get back to a position where we can make sure everybody's well educated and safe um, and able to access the education and, and services that they deserve. I'm going to stop talking now. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to getting your questions in a moment. Thank you so much, Mike. It was honestly great to hear from you and just the encouragement that is needed towards the educational sector. And again, a huge thank you to all the panelists that have spoken so far. Um, it's, it's been incredible to hear from you. Um, and what we will be going into now is the question and answer section um, where I'll be handing over to the chairs that will um, ask a question and direct it specifically to a panel member um, and then we'll hear from them and we just have about 10 minutes in this specific um, section. So um, without further ado, I will um, allow the chairs, Alia, Farah and Michael to lead their questions to the panelists. Um. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mike, um, how can we make sure that mental health is being taught in schools and like what is done to um, make sure that mental health is being like um, taught in schools because it's very important that people have good mental health and understanding um, about what's like happening. That's a really good question Farah and uh, we, we produced a report yesterday looking at services are for mental health for you, for young people. And I think I noticed before somewhere on the call there's somebody from CAMS here so that maybe they'll be able to talk a little bit more about this as, as well. But you're right, we need to make sure that, that, that schools are able to support children developing resilience and, and, and being able to cope with adversity and being able to, to manage the everyday stresses and strains that are an inevitable part of, of a young person's uh, life. But we also need to make sure that the services are there for young people uh, when, when things get even worse than that and, and they need professional help and support. And we've known in the past that, that some of the services have been really slow to respond when children have, have struggled um, with, with mental illness. Um, and, we, and we know that that, that has not always been a very well coordinated area where schools and, and health services and local authorities haven't always worked particularly well together. The report we published yesterday had some good news on that, Farah, in that we are seeing better join up between those different services that we're seeing schools um, working much more closely with with health services mental health services and local authorities when they're identifying problems early but it's not happening everywhere and we need to make sure that all schools are really on the lookout for children who are struggling and that we've got enough of the support to be able to go in and help those young people when, when they are struggling with their, their mental health and well-being thank you amazing um, Alia, do you have a question? My question is, um, how 
question is, um, what are you doing to ensure that children are being treated equally in primary or secondary school? Mike. Yes, I'm getting all the questions. There. I do like having questions asked at me, and I like I like challenging questions. This is a re really important question. Um, so we know that the, there are inequalities that exist. We know that because uh, we see young people from different backgrounds doing less well in educate in, in 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 educational outcomes than, than 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 others, and we keep a really close eye on this when we're inspecting. So when we're inspecting, we're, we're, we're looking to see what schools are doing to make sure that children are doing as well as they can, mm -hmm. that where there are disadvantages for, for particular groups, um, that schools are doing the right kind of things to help those children either catch up or, 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 or to put the, the blocks in place to ensure that help them to, to do that. But there are some groups that, that I really worry about still. Um, and there are some groups in London that I really worry about. Jason talked very eloquently about some of those before, but I, I worry about those children um, who, who aren't learning to read at the beginning of school because that's such a barrier. I, I, I worry enormously about um, black boys in, in London. I, th I think that when you look at the outcomes of black boys and their experiences across uh, education and the criminal justice system um, and, 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 and you know, th their life chances, generally it's a real concern. And I think anybody working in education and social care in London really needs to be thinking about what we are doing to make sure that, that black young boys do as well as, as, as they can. And I think one of the things that we need to continue to do in education actually is to continue to listen to young people to understand what it is like to be a a a, a black boy living in 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 London or a you know a, a a a Muslim girl living in 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 London because if we if we if we don't have those understanding if we if we don't really listen carefully to what it feels like to be that person it's really hard to use services and institutions to help those young people do as well as they need. Amazing, thank you, Mike. Um, and I'll just hand it over to Michael and ask a question and if possible um, to another panel member. Okay. I wanted to ask Mike, um, what is, no, not Mike, sorry, I want to ask Jason, what has been done to teach um, children about mental health in schools? Thanks for that, Michael. Um, yes, we touched on it a little bit earlier. As I said, those um, podcasts that some of the peer outreach team did are terrific. But it's also about helping teachers and other school staff feel more confident to be able to spot the signs of where they might be able to help at quite an early stage. So one of the things we've been working on with an organisation called Thrive London is rolling out, um, I always get the words the wrong way around, let's see if I can get it right, mental health first aid training, that's it, mental health first aid training, and to have somebody who's trained up in every um, school that's our aim to do that over the next few years and we think that can make a real difference and actually to be fair we know the role that teachers and schools play is really important in young people's um, not just education but um, how they're getting on and any worries and concerns but it's also a responsibility for, for all of us and I know a lot of the peer outreach team have done the training and in fact the mayor of London and his team Sadiq's team all did the training quite early on on this. So I think it's a real community initiative. Um, but there's other things as well, a very quick one. It's been a scheme running for all, oh, something like 10 years. But nearly every school in London now is involved in one way or another with something called Healthy Schools London, which schools sign up to. I don't know whether any of you know that your schools are part of Healthy Schools London. And that's about all different aspects of health and well-being. And we work with schools and boroughs all the time to be helping and give guidance, particularly during this difficult period this year when we've been giving extra help because um, of the, you know, the uh, coronavirus period. So that's a couple of examples, Michael. Is that OK? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, and now um, it would be great to open it out to the schools that are in attendance with us today and young people to ask any questions if you have it, if you do so, um, either indicate in the chat box or unmute and a representative to ask your question towards a panelist. Um, well, uh, uh, with the, like, like the racial, racial injustice, um, we have seen this year, are schools now becoming like more aware 
of uh, teaching black history now that um, we're trying to make it more um, more like aware for schools to um, yeah. Thank you for your question. Yes, the answer in short is yes. Um, schools are becoming more aware. Teachers are becoming a lot more interested in making sure that black history is part of um, their curriculums. However, um, this current government that we have makes it very difficult for our teachers to feel supported in that um, because of the recent government guidance that came out a couple of weeks ago around some words that can and cannot be used. Some teachers are actually expressing a lot of concern with how they can actually do this in ways that um, would be accurate, but also empowering for the students and all the students that they're teaching. So it's not just for the black students, but for every single student. So I'm seeing that a lot of teachers are approaching us more and asking for help, but that is combined with a fear because they don't want to get in trouble by the government for breaking the law. Thank you so much for the questions. If there aren't any more questions or if there are, do feel free to use the chat box and to interact with us um, and our chairs. Um, but at this point in time, um, I'd like to introduce um, Maria from a school in East London who has a speech for us this morning. Hello, I'm Maria and I'm a year four child and I'm from Godwin Junior. And the first thing is like, I'm very like, I'm so amazed that I was allowed to do this. So on to it. The articles that I think Godwin like displays are the articles 14, 16, 24, 28, 30 and 31. So 14 is every child has the right to believe and think their religion. Um, we like do this because we have a whole day called RE Day and we each, every year has a different um, religion to focus on, like Hindu or Sikh or yeah. Um, so yeah, and then 16 is every child has the right to privacy. We do this because like, if like a child has like a problem, like for example, if they had like a family problem, we would respect that. And instead of being like, so what is it? We would just move on and respect that they might not want to share. So then 24 is every child has the right to the best possible help. We have PE days, two days a week. And we have the pack lunch policy that ensures that we can't bring any snacks that are too sugary or too salty um so we do that and then 28 is every child has the right to an education we do this because like we have quite a lot of like disabled people or people with disabilities so like for example if they do we would still teach them we would still help them to learn what they need to know and then 30 is every child has the right to learn and use their language. So for example, French, we the whole school up to year six, from year three to year six, um, teaches um, the French. And we like, if people are from different backgrounds, we like, they can speak it. So that, that, and then 31, the last one, every child has the right to relax, play, and take part in a wide range of cultural and artistic activities. We have two play times every day, one in the morning, one at lunch. And we usually have like brain breaks. Like if we've been sitting down for like longer than a while, like if we've been sitting down for a while, then we would like our teachers would like have a brain break and do like games like jump, jumping jacks and like, exercises so yeah incredible thank you so much Maria it's so lovely to hear from you and just the brain breaks for me is something that is is amazing to hear that um is something that you do um just before we go on to the next um performer 
We do have a question here from Doreen, um, and the question is, how has racism changed getting a good job and education? And I'll pass this question over to um, Lavinia. Okay, so the question is, how has racism changed getting the job and education? I think it presents um, a situation where it, it, it prevents the access. So, um, well, I think there's different sides to it, but I'd say the main two things is like the, the information. So the kind of information that you would be exposed to because of racism, um, it, it limits the kind of exposure that you have. So for example, if you um, are black and you go to a school that isn't um, a, a privileged school, you obviously won't be getting opportunities that would allow you to excel in, for example, an area of like business and finance because of the lack of information that you have. So I think firstly, it limits the kind of access that you have to information that helps you to kind of exceed in life um, and make the situation better for your community. And then I'd also say that when you're inside of that place, it just makes, um, well, inside of a place where racism is abundant, it makes it very difficult to actually build sustainable relationships with people um, and it impacts your mental health so for many people mental health and um, racism is is two of the same thing because if you're unable to um, feel like you're respected within the workplace environment if people are calling you names um, or if there's like microaggressions which is a, which is a term that is used to explain small racist acts um, and you're constantly questioned and put into question because you are black that's going to affect your mental health so i'd also say that like yeah has how has racism changed getting a job in education i'd say those two ways because it just makes it more difficult for um black students to excel um and also for black staff to to have um a com a, a feeling of comfort in their workplace and their education which fits into the stats that we see um that you know black students are a lot more likely to be excluded and undermarked um, and, you know, similarly in the workplace, it's, it makes it more difficult to actually get to higher ranking. So I think in two sides, it's about the access to information and then also your experience when you're actually within those places as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lavinia. Um, and now we will be going to a performance where we will play a video by Farah and then afterwards hear from Farah herself. Hey guys, and I'm Farah Sarich, and I live and go to school in West London. I'm also an athlete and a hockey player, and an 11 year old kid. Here's my top tips and strategies to keep your body and mind healthy. For me, exercise is crucial to my well-being. When I run or play hockey, or even just play a fun active games with my family, I feel so great afterwards. Most mornings we go for an early morning run. We do this as a family to motivate each other and we also bond too. We go at our own pace as I'm often a lot faster. But we also do really fun stuff like relays which my younger brothers love. We practice good sportsmanship as we keep it light hearted as it's super important when playing sports we have so much fun. This sets me and my brothers up for a great day of homeschooling. The next thing I do is try and eat really healthily, lots of fruit and vegetables. I get involved with cooking and baking, which makes eating so much fun. Recently, I've been making lots of vegetable soups and smoothies with my mummy. These are great for our immune system and well-being. Eating well means we perform well and we feel happier as a result. The other thing I do if I'm having any problems with school, life or puberty is I talk to a family member or a really good friend. It's essential that we talk and never let problems fester inside of us. Finally, sleep is essential to good well-being. I recommend eight to 10 hours of sleep for a grown kid and no devices one hour before bedtime. If we're really having a difficult day, we meditate or have some quiet time for about five to 10 minutes and reminisce about our happy faces. It's a really lovely thing to do and perfect before bedtime. Just to recap guys, my top four tips are number one, sleep well. Number two, eat well. Number three, exercise. And number four, talk. Please don't suffer in silence. There are people who love and care for you and want you to be happy. Bye, guys. Wow, what an incredible video. Thank you so much, Farah, for those tips. Um, and now I'll actually hand it over to you, Farah, to say a few words for us. 
Uh, thank you everyone for all your insightful contributions to today's panel. I would like to conclude with my own thoughts and suggestions to the official on what I would, um, what I believe would be useful and impactful to children across London and their schools to do with education. I'm an athlete, a hockey player, a mental health campaigner, and an IT ambassador, and these are my thoughts. For me, I feel sport should be as important and math and English in schools. I believe we would have happier children as, as a result who would achieve more both inside and outside the classroom. They would feel fitter and stronger and make the world a happier place. I feel that sports and exercise should be our priority in schools, and schools should educate children on the power of exercise and the benefits it has on our physical and mental well-being. For me, if we exercise, I believe we feel so much better mentally and achieve more as a result. I would like to see more sports timetables in school and more sports lessons and opportunities for young children. I feel we have to step up, not, not only as individuals, but so the government can see this as an opportunity to up the stakes on sports participation in schools. One year ago, I visited Wellington College, where they were the first school to introduce mindfulness classes 13 years ago. I also believe schools all across the country should introduce at least one mindfulness class um, at least one mindfulness class a week so their students can further improve uh, on their well-being. If we make sports a priority within schools, I believe the world would be a happier place and people would achieve more. Last but not least, I was recently asked about my link-up group, which advises the London Mayor on issues relevant to young people living in London, what my favourite quote is. And it is, exercise is the most transformative thing you can do for your brain today. I came across this quote by watching a TED talk by a neuroscientist, Wenny Suzuki, who also said, to achieve your maximum benefits, you must exercise at least three to four times a week for half an hour, for up to half an hour, to get your heart rate up. By doing this, she says, and I agree, it will change the trajectory, trajectory of your life for the better. Thank you so much. Wow, no, thank you, Farah, not only for your tips, but also just hearing from you, honestly, incredibly powerful. And I know there are smiles all around um, this call today. So thank you so much, Farah. Um, and now I would like to pass it back to Tasman and Anmol, our amazing organisers. I would just like to say a massive thank you to everybody from the panellists, for their excellent speeches and talks today, as well as our co-chairs and our chairs for speaking and all the schools that have attended alongside the guests. Like I hope today has been insightful. Like um, we do have a few more sessions. So we have our race and discrimination up next as well as our refugee and migrants one in the afternoon. Um, for those that aren't going to be staying along, I just wanna thank you so much for your attendance and cooperation today. And we'll definitely be in contact and we'll keep you up to date in regards to what we're going to go forward with in the inquiry. Thank you so much everyone for your contributions so far um, i'm looking forward to the to the next part but it's been a great start and uh thank you everyone so perfect um i guess like um for those that will be attending you have like a 40 minutes break so yeah um i'll see you all shortly and for the rest of you i hope you have a lovely day and a lovely christmas and a hopefully a better new year so thank you so much everyone